Welcome listeners, subscribers, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card in, Insights. Uh, I've got an episode today. First, to thank the sponsors, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, ComC, COMC.com, Burbank Sports Cards, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Heritage Auctions, Huggins and Scott Auctions, Tops, Panini, and Upper Deck. Uh, I was out at the show today. This is uh, Sunday evening now. <laughs> Again, I try to do timely and evergreen episodes, but sometimes it's just you need to strike while the iron's hot. So I had been doing these investment fallacy articles or uh, episodes and touching base with some of the things that I wanted to share with my listeners. And all of a sudden, I found myself at this show uh, yesterday and this morning, and I realized that uh, I, was, I was sitting with a dealer that uh, was doing a lot of the things that I think are are good to get more repeat business and to and to be successful, not just in the short run, but in the long run. So uh, I'll play the interview for you in just a minute, but it was uh, unedited. It's just uh, I just showed up this morning and said, hey, do you mind if I record some uh, uh, conversation that we can uh, post for uh, some of the listeners who are interested in uh, in uh, in this podcast? So, again, he's it was a. Uh, uh, a nice guest to have, and and we had a good conversation, and look forward. And then I wound up buying some cards from him, which then I brought home and and tried to see what I have. As I said, you know, when you when you're buying things out of a out of a cheaper cheaper box, there there's some bargains in there, but you can't look up every card, and so you're going to miss a few and and hit a few. So uh, all in all, though, I I did fine. And uh, again, he was a he he was a good sport for, to participate in the interview. We had a good time. And he's, uh, I'll see him again in three months and, and, uh, hopefully he will have, uh, reloaded. Uh, but again, when you go to a card show, you, there, there's no one best way or only way to do things. So, uh, again, just, uh, listen to this uh, episode with interest. Uh, thank, uh, Jimmy for being the guest and I uh, thank you for listening as well. So I'll, uh, move straight to that. And after that finishes again, we'll be done and I'll see you again tomorrow. Any ideas you have for episodes, just just hit me with an email at drjamesbeckett at gmail.com. Welcome. Another, this is a special episode, Dr. James Beckett Sports Card Insights, our daily podcast that takes on different uh, kinds of topics each time. I'm here with uh, Jimmy Fisher, a uh, dealer from Tulsa that's down here for sure. We're actually on location at Kyle Robertson's Louisville show. It's a three-day show. Jimmy's down here, and I found that the way he is doing business is... An example of what I've been talking about in this industry, I've done a few episodes lately about investment fallacies, how people sometimes think there's a certain way to do it. And Jimmy is showing exactly what I'm talking about, that there's an approach that actually works even better than conventional wisdom. So first of all, welcome, Jimmy. Welcome Thank to you. the show. Thank you for and uh, tell us a little bit about your hobby background, how you got started as a kid, just a little bit of context. I got started collecting baseball cards uh, just south of Boston. Uh, fourth grade, joined a little league team. In Boston, you said? Boston. Boston. Massachusetts. Okay, okay. So started playing little league baseball. All my friends were collecting, so mm -hmm. I started collecting no, with my dad and my, my okay. big brother. It's a great family hobby. What, was it always as a hobby when you were a kid, or were you buying and selling? No, no, it was just just a hobby. We didn't really have many shows the town I grew up in. Yeah. Uh, we had one card store in the mall a couple towns over, and uh, buying packs down at the, the gas station. That was it. What... Uh, when do you start being a dealer? Because I've actually had two positive experiences with you at these shows down here, and I noticed the way you do it. So, at what time did you switch from being a collector to being a to being a more of a dealer? Well, I've I've had friends that have uh, owned a store in, in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, S and S Sports Cards. I worked with them for years, more uh, just to kind of more for fun, yeah. part time. Uh, and then my friend Kevin over at Cardboard Inc. He uh, I've been working with him for a few years now, and really I just started setting up my own tables. Uh, about a year ago, going to these shows and working with friends, helping them out, and I just didn't really like what I saw, and I thought you would do it a different way. Yeah, I could maybe bring something nobody else is doing. So, well, you are doing it differently, and you know, like I said, here an example of what I've been suggesting to people because so many people do the same thing because mm -hmm. they think it's. But okay, so you've come down to the Dallas area for these three day shows, mm -hmm. and you set up in ways that are, again, like we said, not typical. You're you found a niche. One of the episodes I did a couple weeks ago was about. Most people think the only way to make money in this industry is to buy low and sell high. Mm -hmm. In reality, aren't you buying low and selling low? Yeah, yes, and uh, I sell the way that I collected when I was a kid. And for me, it wasn't about the value necessarily. It was about the hunt. It was about the camaraderie. It was standing there going through, you know, 25 cent boxes, 10 cent boxes mm -hmm. for an hour while mom was at the grocery store and talking to the old timers and learning about the players that, you know, pre TV era and, and the history behind the game. And so for me, it was never about how much money, you know, 
And so that's the way I sell is I, 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 I buy cheap. If I can't get it cheap enough to sell it cheap, then I just move on to something else. Well, uh, two things I've noticed because I've had two experiences now. One is that you're, you're pretty generous with young people when they yeah. come. You really are very welcoming to some of these young kids are there. But you also have a business sense of knowing that you can't just, for example, we talked about coming down for a one-day show. Probably, yeah. I mean, you're not doing this as a charitable endeavor. You're enjoying it, but it ought to, you ought to make some money. Is yeah, and, and the, way, the way that I do that is, like I said, um, when I do a show, it's typically with Cardboard Inc. We split costs. Okay. Uh, you can see on this this show, we're kind of set up. You wouldn't even know that we're two separate dealers. So that keeps the cost down. Okay. Um, and like I said, if I can't find it cheap enough that I can sell it cheap, then I just don't buy it. Where, where are you buying? I mean, if you want to disclose, I mean, where are you coming up with this stuff? Where is that? Um, at, at these shows. I, basically, I, I deal with a lot of stuff that other dealers just don't want to. For example, yesterday that we had some gentlemen uh, busting some wax a few booths down, and they literally were giving away, you know, cards that the non the ten cent twenty. If yeah. it wasn't a big hit, they just they have no need for it. So you just have to find those people. You work out a deal with them, and you're essentially one man's trash is another kid's treasure. So. Well, it doesn't have to be. Totally trash or totally no. treasure. There's something in between. No, we're talking, you know, decent cards. You know, if, I know. You're, if you're a if you're a ten year old kid and you find a, a Steph Curry insert card in a quarter box, that just made your day. Right. If you can find a Steph Curry or Steph Curry Giannis base card in a ten cent box, exactly. You know, and you can do that. You just have to be patient and you have to be vigilant. And yet, the person that. that brought it to you was disappointed because they were looking for the big hit. Yeah, exactly. And there's there's nothing wrong with that either. But that's yeah. kind of the buy low, sell high. There's you're trying to buy a box and getting exactly. a monster. There's a thousand dealers that will take care of a, a grown man with. You know, credit card in his pocket. There's no, there's not a lot of dealers <laughs> left. You know, and we don't have that next generation that we're, we're right. cultivating. It's all high money now. Well, my hats off to you, but when because that's really is the future of our industry is, that yeah. there'll be more kids. But it seems like if somebody comes up to your table to sell you something, they're not thinking. Well, they they already can see that you have a dime area, a quarter area, and so if you make them an offer, it's it's going to be in the context of here's what I'm going to sell it for. And I, I found. At first, and it's still something I'm struggling with, is you don't want to offend somebody. But at the same time, because of the way I sell it. Yeah, but it's, it's right in front of them. But yeah, exactly. And you can just say, as you can see, this is what I'm going to do with it. And I try to be honest with them. This is exactly, right. these cards are going to go in this quarter exactly. box, and this is what I can spend. And I've actually, I get a positive response. And, and like I said, most of the, the, the higher dollar guys, they're just trying to get rid of that stuff anyway. Right, they just right. don't want to carry it around. So. Uh, another episode that I did a week ago was the investment fallacy of sometimes overvaluing supply versus demand. And I think you've seen some of the things I've bought from you are low demand, but also low supply. Yeah. And so if I'm willing to be patient mm -hmm. and buy something, it may not sell for five years. Right. That's probably not what most people want to do is buy a card. Exactly. And even if you quadruple your money in five years, you just made 30% a year. And that sounds great if you can do it. But if you buy four cards... And only one of them sells in the next exactly. four, five years. You, you kind of broke high, even. Yeah, high so reward, but high risk as well. So. Uh, another episode I did was about the investment fallacy of if you're really into this industry, you'll be full time instead of part time. And people to think if I can make this much money if I do uh, this weekend, one weekend a month, or do something like that. Wow! If I multiply by all the weekends or quit my day job, I, I, you know, if you just do the pure math, it sounds like it'd be wonderful. But it sort of sometimes can be not as much fun to do this yeah. full time. So what's your response to that? Do you see well, it the way I see it there? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, it's a hobby. For me, it's it's always been about the, the fun in it. And so, yeah, I want to make money, but if it's not fun, I'm not going to do it. So yeah. I, I do this part-time. Uh, well, fun you know. would be losing money. And fun well, would be if, if, doing yeah, stuff you don't like if doing. If it's not sustainable, you, you know, you got to yeah. find something else to, right. to occupy your time. But if there's a way to make some money, still have fun, uh, That's that's why I do it. I'm not here to make you know a ton of money. I think that kind of ruins it. I think that's what's wrong with the hobby is that everybody wants the most money the quickest as possible, and that's why it's got so high end, and the kids have been priced out of it. And you know, for me, I just I like seeing a look on a kid's face when when he gets a deal, and you know, he, you give him something for free. Even you know, I don't I don't have the money or the desire to to, to gamble on high dollar cards and flip them quick. I'm going to put this episode up tomorrow, the next day, but it's, I was driving home from the show yesterday and I realized that some of these episodes I've been doing about these ways to approach making money, that you were such a good example. And I've been at your table at the, at the close and had another good experience as I did three months ago when you're down here. But the episode I did this morning, which was already pre-recorded, was about the investment fallacy of profit maximization, which almost everybody in this room is doing, except I don't think that's the best way to go. And in fact, that's what you're doing too. You're not maximizing your profits. 
on any yeah. one sale. Right. And therefore, I'm here again to spend actually not a lot of my hard-earned money, but, but uh, I'm enjoying going through your boxes. And you're not selling things at the maximum price you could get right. because you know now you have a loyal customer in me and probably many others because because you're 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 not you're not giving it away but like I say especially on these low demand cards you're not trying to get maximum price for it. But I also if, don't what, have to have when I do a show if I if that one customer doesn't come in and spend a thousand dollars my show's not ruined because right. I've got a hundred other customers right. that know I'm coming like like right. yourself that, right. that I've kind of talked to and gotten to know. And I, I would much rather get smaller sales from a lot of customers that I get to talk to and that I know and build a relationship right. with and have fun doing it right. than stand here and wait three days for that one unicorn that's going to come in and buy that $2,000, $3,000 car. That's, to me, that's no fun. So I'd rather deal with $50 tickets instead of you know, $100 and $200 tickets. The other thing, you know, back when I was a dealer, and you got to go back to the 70s when I had tables at shows, uh, again, it was mostly a vintage industry mm -hmm. at that time. But if you didn't watch your table like a hawk, and again, 99% of people are honest, mm -hmm. but it just takes one to palm yeah. off, and they're never palming off from the 25 cents. You'd have box. to pick up a, a pretty big box and well, walk off. That's for me what to, I, yeah. I tell my wife. If yeah. somebody wants to steal from me, they might get a hernia. Yeah. Before they would, before There's really they, nothing easy that you can grab I mean, that from my table that's going to hurt you. You don't yeah. have to watch it like a hawk. Exactly. If they steal one thing, your, your, uh, your weekend is ruined. Uh, any questions you have for me? Because you, you, when I'm here, you know who I am, and you can kind of get a sense of the kinds of things I'm, I'm picking up. But any, any questions you might have from when you were a kid, or? I, I, well, my my question is, is, you know, what, how, what made you come up with the idea? Like, you were a dealer, you yeah. know, what made? I've done where was that moment where you said well, I, I was, can do something better? I was better. finishing up uh, graduate school, you know, so I was getting a PhD in statistics, and this is a statistical problem that there was a lot of there was a lot of data, but it was never collected back in the '70s. People, there were a few people that had some inside knowledge, but most people didn't. But I was one of the ones that did. And I thought I could either keep it to myself and do pretty well, because I did fine or as a dealer, obviously, or I could share it and even expand it and, and uh, synthesize it, improve it, and publish it. And those first few price guys were free. And then people thought, mm. And they thought you're going to kill the hobby. It's going to, you know, people it did the opposite. It yeah. grew the hobby. I can't so, imagine. I started collecting in the late 80s, early yeah. 90s. I couldn't imagine doing it back then without my Beckett every month. Well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, that, that was the goal to make it helpful, to make it useful that people would, uh, that would level the playing field. Uh, again, as you're here, I mean, you're, you're a willing seller. I'm a willing buyer. We both kind of know what the book value or the eBay value or something, but the time value money. Yeah. Is such that you say, well, you know, if I sell this, you can't put a price I'll on move that. it on. And so it's, it's, um, uh, any other questions? Because we're just a couple of guys talking behind a table on a Sunday morning after I'm back from church with my super understanding wife. <laughs> you say, let's go to early church so you can, you can, uh, hit the show before it gets crowded. No, I'm and not, be back for the Cowboy game. I wasn't really prepared. I, I'm sure if they give me enough time, I could get a list okay. for you for the next time I see you. Well, next time we'll, we'll see if, uh, actually, this show, I hope, has been good enough for you. Yeah, well, I'll be back. Kyle is is got a concept of these three day shows at it in moving around in different parts of the metroplex. And Dallas is a is a is a strong city, so I think I think uh, I think he'll do it again. I don't know if he's a twice a year or three times a year. I believe he's already guy. booked the Allen Convention Center where it was three months uh, ago uh, for two more shows in the next. Okay, I believe so. If I'm not well, mistaken. Cool. In the meantime, uh, how can uh, listeners, if they think, hey, this Jimmy guy sounds interesting, where, where would they find you uh, social media-wise? Um, I'm on Facebook. I have a Facebook group. It's BA Sports Memorabilia. Um, we're out of, I'm out of Tulsa, so I have a lot of local customers that when I get things, um, I go to them first before anything else. Okay. Um, memorabilia mostly. I don't do a lot of cards on there. but uh, Also, I sell a cardboard ink uh, at eBay. Cardboard ink with a K would be okay, right. uh, our seller handle. So... But if you join the page, you know, we try to post updates on shows we're going to be at. Or if you're looking for something, you know, I can send it out to my network and we can try to get people looking for it. So even if it's something high end, which I don't deal with, I can get you to the right person. The right, yeah. We have people in Oklahoma City, Wichita, uh, that we can get feelers out. Well, I like the aspect that you're, you're in social media, but you're geographically clustered. I mean, we do have customers stuff, all over. We do ship. I know, but if you're mainly, like the then you have a chance to get face to face. So we've had face to face today, listeners, and uh, enjoyed visiting with Jimmy Fisher. Uh, we'll do it again the next time. In the meantime, I'm signing off in order to make some purchases from my new main man, Jimmy Fisher. So again, thanks, listeners. Uh, be back again tomorrow with another episode.